Welcome to the History Den YouTube channel. This is the 15th video in the Ancient Greek series. Today we are going to focus on the great Athenian leader Pericles. And this is the time that Athens moment has really arrived. They are a major player not just in Greece, but all around the Eastern Mediterranean. Pericles will lead Athens during a span of time that roughly covers the period between the end of the Persian Wars and the start of the tragic Peloponnesian Wars. Pericles' name in Greek means surrounded by glory, and he would not let the meaning of that name down as he became one of Athens' greatest leaders. I mean, if you took JFK's popularity, Abraham Lincoln's speaking ability, and George Washington's ability as a general, you might get someone on the level of Pericles. During the time of Pericles, there was a huge sense of optimism in Athens. But not just Athens, this was occurring all around Greece. And it is for that reason that this has often been called the Golden Age. The Golden Age of Athenian culture is usually dated from 449 to 431 BC. And this was a time of relative peace between the Persian and Peloponnesian Wars. Though there were some minor skirmishes and battles, as it always seemed the Greeks couldn't go a couple of years without swinging swords at each other. Fighting was just in their blood. Now, Athens had suffered considerable damage in the wars with Persia, along with the depletion of her treasury. It was Pericles who restored all of this, and the period under Pericles also saw its greatest building projects and contribution to the arts, and so Athens really reached the height of its artistic achievement. Pericles changed the face of Athens for all time. This would be truly an imperial city capable of leading the Athenian Empire, and it was a future that was set under Pericles. Now, Pericles was born in 495 BC. He was the son of the legendary admiral Xanthippus, who was the victorious admiral at the Battle of Mycale and was a hero of the Persian War. He was, through his mother, from one of the most powerful and influential families in Athens. So Pericles had important paternal and maternal connections, which is always a nice recipe for future success. And both of his parents pushed the young Pericles to become engaged in Athenian politics. Pericles grew up in the company of artists and philosophers and musicians. And this would play a huge role on Pericles' character later on when he became the de facto leader of Athens. And this influence led him to become a huge supporter of the arts. Now, although Pericles was an aristocrat, he ended up supporting the lower classes. And when Themistocles faced a crisis in his leadership, the young Pericles lent his support to Themistocles. And it was through this support of Themistocles that saw Pericles come into conflict with Cimon. And so Cimon would become the bitter arch rival of Pericles. Pericles started his political career in the law courts. And as a result of his conflict with Cimon, he became one of the leading prosecutors to get Cimon out of Athens. And he succeeded in 461 BC when Cimon was ostracized. So all of this brought Pericles a lot of attention. After Cimon's banishment, Pericles and a man named Ephialtes took the lead. It's almost like a switch from the Republicans to the Democrats. The party that supports the lower classes is now in power. And Ephialtes acted in a way as a mentor to the young Pericles. Now, Cimon's exit permanently wrecked the relationship between Sparta and Athens because Cimon was the main sponsor of Sparta in Athens. Ephialtes viewed the Spartans very differently. He looked at the Spartans as the enemy and therefore sponsored a very anti-Spartan policy in Athens. And so there was no reason to assume Pericles wouldn't continue that policy when Ephialtes was murdered in 461 BC. Now certainly you have to wonder, had Cimon remained in power and kept the pro-Spartan policy in place, would the Peloponnesian War have even happened three decades later? Because certainly Pericles and Ephialtes were more antagonistic towards the Spartans than Cimon. One could actually argue that Cimon was a little bit more realistic and not as overconfident as Ephialtes, because Ephialtes really wanted to pound the Spartans into the ground. Cimon seemed to understand Athens' place in the pecking order in terms of military might. I think Cimon understood the power of Sparta and both admired it and respected it. 
and he kind of wasn't drinking the Kool-Aid like Ephialtes was about Athens' rise. Now, Athens was certainly more powerful after the Persian Wars, but could they beat Spartan in a head-to-head matchup? Well, the Peloponnesian Wars 30 years later would answer that very question. Now, back to Ephialtes' assassination in 461 BC. It seems likely that this was probably done by the vengeful allies of Chemon. Interestingly, though, this is one of the very few political assassinations in Athenian history. And this is quite a contrast from ancient Rome, where political assassinations became the norm. I mean, Sulla and later Mark Antony and Octavian were forming lists to have people executed or either thrown out of Rome altogether. So after Ephialtes' death, Pericles is left as the main political figure in Athens. As a result, Pericles was able to consolidate his position as the leading statesman for Athens. This allowed him to pass his own reforms and create policy. Now keep in mind, he still had to go through the assembly and he had to be re-elected every year, so this is still a democracy. But it's a democracy that Pericles was able to expand upon and bring it to its full extent with the reforms that he ushered in. It's kind of a new brand of democracy, and he expands upon the reforms that Cleisthenes had set in motion some 50 years before, and thus Pericles is able to take democracy to its zenith, kind of the way we know classical Athens today. One thing that aided Pericles was he was an amazing speaker, and combined that with a reputation for honesty, he became extremely popular in Athenian politics. So he sort of possessed this silver tongue, which helped him get everything past he wanted to. And with that, he could begin rebuilding much of the city that was destroyed during the Persian Wars. Okay, so Pericles' reforms gave more power to the people, the assembly, and the courts. Now, anyone could join Athenian politics, regardless of what class you came from, or how much money you had. In other words, there were no sets of criteria that were used to eliminate anybody from rising in Athenian politics. And as I said before, democracy really reaches its zenith under Pericles. And in terms of decisions, everything was decided by a majority vote. I don't think you can get more democratic than that, right? I mean, here in the United States, we elect officials and then they kind of make the decisions. But in Athens, everything was decided by the majority, a simple majority vote. And under Pericles, politics was really central in Athenian society. Pretty much everybody was involved with it. I mean, can you imagine that today, where everybody seems as disinterested as ever in politics? But in those days, that was pretty much the only game in town. Pericles' social innovations were equally important to the golden age of Athens. For the first time, the poor were allowed to attend theatrical performances, and they accomplished this by subsidizing the ticket price for theater admission. And that's a huge deal, because that was kind of like going to the movie theater in those days. Pericles also enabled more civic participation by offering to pay for jury duty and other civil services. So he's trying to get everybody involved with the government. Now, in 454 BC, he led a successful military campaign in Corinth and sponsored the establishment of Athenian colonies, and in 443, he was elected to the generalship, a position he held with only one short interruption for the rest of his life. So back to that military campaign in Corinth for a minute. That almost led to an all-out war. So there are these events that are occurring that almost cause an all-out war in Greece. But it doesn't happen, of course, in earnest until 431 BC, which is generally regarded as the start of the major Peloponnesian War. Now, as I said before, Pericles was a huge fan of Themistocles. And so he based his military doctrine off of the policies that Themistocles established. And that military doctrine required that Athens maintain naval superiority around the eastern Mediterranean. And so think of it this way. Let's say Corinth adds 20 ships. Okay, the Athens is going to go ahead and add 60 or 40, whatever it is. They're going to have double, triple the navy that anyone else has around Greece. And part of the reason was... Pericles believed that the Peloponnesians were nearly invincible on land. So he was going to try to minimize those advantages by doing two things, maintaining naval superiority and rebuilding the walls around Athens. And that will become a huge sore point with Sparta. Because let's think about that for one second here. The Spartans, along with pretty much every city in Greece, were not experts at siege warfare. So if Athens goes ahead and puts up those walls, they've basically neutralized the Spartan land army. So this was the source of a huge 
huge disagreement between the Athenians and the Spartans. And the Spartans asked the Athenians not to do it, and the Athenians just kind of brushed them aside and went ahead with it anyways. So as I said before, there are all these events during Pericles' reign that are leading up to the events that ultimately happened in 431 BC. Now, as I mentioned before, Pericles saw that many of the buildings in Athens were still in a state of disrepair after the devastating Persian Wars. And so he made it his life's mission to restore and expand upon Athens' glory. If Athens was going to be the lead city in a growing empire, it had to act and look like one. And so Pericles literally goes all across the Mediterranean and collects up all the best architects, painters, and sculptors, and puts together this kind of dream team to work on his new projects. And Pericles also raided the Delian treasury and uses those proceeds to pay for these large enterprises that he is continually working on. I shouldn't say raided though, because by this time it's hardly the Delian treasury anymore. It existed in name only. It's really the Athenian treasury. And so Pericles sets out on his mission to make Athens a truly imperial city. Pericles focused much of his attention on the Acropolis, the center of Athens and home to the most important temple in Athens. Just decades earlier, the Persians had destroyed the Acropolis. So the Acropolis was first on Pericles' list of structures that needed to be repaired. And at the center of it all would be the fabulous Parthenon. And after it was built, a massive statue of Athena was placed inside the Parthenon. It was a hugely expensive enterprise, costing up to 5,000 talents. To give you an idea, the Peloponnese's War costed Athens 2,000 talents a year. So this was a huge project in every sense of the word. The Parthenon would be built out of huge blocks of marble and decorated with a beautiful frieze. And building their structures out of marble was something that the Romans copied later on. Now you can see down below here this artist's depiction of the frieze that ran across the inner wall of the temple. So the Parthenon became the symbol of Athenian greatness. This not only showed to Athens' allies what a beautiful and powerful city Athens was, but it also provided jobs and gave work to the average Athenians, because jobs are always the key to any economy, present or ancient. As I mentioned before, housed inside the Parthenon was the statue of the Greek goddess Athena. Her skin was made of pure ivory, and her clothing was made from pure gold. It took six years to complete the statue. Can you imagine six years to build a statue? The statue was 40 feet high. It must have been quite a sight to behold. Here Athens' might and power was on full display, and this must have made a serious impression on anyone that entered that temple. I can only imagine that travelers must have passed on the word to Sparta, and thus the Spartans must have wondered and feared what on earth was going on in Athens. Are they really going to build an empire which we can't hope to defeat? Now, that Athenian statue is now gone, unfortunately. But the Parthenon, of course, remains today. Pericles was not just interested in constructing buildings, though. He was also a keen patron of education and the arts. He maintained close relationships with all of the leading intellects of his time, including Herodotus, who is regarded as the world's first historian. A defining event in the career of Pericles is, of course, the Great Peloponnesian War, a war that Pericles brought brought Athens into. Now, we will get to that war in its entirety, but it's worth mentioning here since Pericles is the main topic of this video. Thucydides, of course, is the great historian who documents much of the Peloponnesian War for us, and he says that Sparta felt more and more threatened and began to demand concessions from the Athenians. Pericles refused, and in 431, conflict between Athens and Sparta's ally, Corinth, pushed the Spartans into invading Attica. Pericles adopted a strategy that played to the Athenians' advantage as a naval force by evacuating the surrounding countryside of Athens. This would deny the superior Spartan armies anyone really to fight. With all of these people collected within the walls of Athens, Pericles was free to make opportunistic seaborne attacks on Sparta's allies. The strategy at first worked very well, but then one of those unforeseen events occurs that Pericles could not have planned for. A plague broke out in Athens that killed thousands of Athenians and caused serious social upheaval. It was so bad that Pericles himself was briefly deposed in 430, but after the Athenians' efforts to negotiate with Sparta failed, he was quickly reinstated. 
but still the plague continued. And in 429 BC, both of Pericles' sons died of the plague, and a few months later, it claimed Pericles himself. His death was an unmitigated disaster for Athens, since there really was no one in Athens up to the task of keeping the overall strategy in place. And with that, the new leadership began to make serious errors in judgment that would eventually lead to Athens' undoing. There is no doubt that with Pericles' death, the golden age of Athens began to slide away. The legacy of Pericles was such that the ancient historian Thucydides called Pericles the first citizen of Athens. In the next video, we will begin to look at the Peloponnesian War and the events that led up to it, and then of course several more videos on the war itself.